today's show is all about getting sober. I'm a teetotaler, so I'll just 12 step my way out the door. Leave it to the experts on Steve Brown, etc. He's an old white guy, an author, broadcaster, and seminary professor who's sick of religion. And he's brought friends. Please welcome, etc. And we are those friends. We are, etc. It's Steve Brown, etc. Without Steve Brown this week, I'm Eric, the young white guy. And, contrary to popular belief, I can stop talking about addiction anytime I want. <laughs> I just choose not to. Uh, wait, wait a second. <laughs> young compared to Steve? Like, wait, yeah, young, young compared young to white? Steve. Okay, okay. Just <laughs> go with the program okay. here, man. <laughs> <laughs> go with the show prep. That's our resident megachurch pastor, Zach Van Dyke. He has a new prosperity gospel book coming out, and uh, it's called God Wants You to Have a Boat. Oh. So keep an eye out for that one. Yep. I like it. It's going to be a bestseller because I'm going to get my church to buy you know millions of copies of it. And I'm sure you can follow that journey on social media. Matthew Porter is here. Sometimes the voices tell Matthew, quit while you're ahead. And that's when Matthew calmly replies, Check your math voices. We are not ahead. Not even close. <laughs> Our producer Jinx is working hard in the little glass booth, and Jinx possesses the music genius of Benjamin Franklin and the DIY skills of Aretha Franklin. Did I get that backwards? I what? hope so. No, no, no. Just trying to wade through this. Might be part of history I'm not aware of. Voluminous uh, intros here. Our director, video director John Myers, is in the tech bunker. If there was a problem, yo, he'll solve it. And Kathy Wyatt, the soft feminine side of the program. She's a big believer in flower power. Flower what? like baking. Oh, see, like, there oh, we yeah. go. Yeah. See, Matt, I told you that one wouldn't work. You got to wow. be careful when you get into hippie did any baking. Of, did any of them work? I don't know. <laughs> I, no, I think Listen. this was, yeah. No, no I, I thought the first one like was really good. If a baseball player gets three out of ten, he goes to the Hall of Fame. That's right. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> Oh, Michael, Michael, John Cusick, thank you for joining us. Thank you for enduring the introduction as we brought all the players. Thank you for joining us again. Michael has joined us previously on Steve Brown, etc. cetera. Uh, talked about his book, Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. Love this quote uh, from G.K. Chesterton. Every man who knocks on the door of a brothel is looking for God. And I think... Uh, if you're uh, looking at the bottom of mm -hmm. a bottle, you're, you're looking for him there, too. And so we're going to talk about addiction. But more than addiction, uh, we're going to talk about legacy. And this came up because on the Restoring the Soul podcast, Michael recently featured a, 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 a talk that was given by his dad, Jim, at an AA meeting. And Jim was 80 years old at the time. And uh, he was you know, recounting the, the stories, the history of his struggle to even be able to, you know, get past the denial that, that uh, you know, ah, you know, I don't got a problem, and then and get to the place of, uh, of, of real healing. I mean, even there was this period of time where he wasn't drinking, but he was absolutely miserable, but he got to a place where sobriety was really a, a delight to him mm -hmm. and better than, than that, that life of addiction. So I, I was really drawn to this, you know, as Matt put in the show prep, you know, I'm always talking about addiction. I got my little mini book, The Gift of Addiction. You can check that out at keylife.org. And um, this idea of legacy came up because as Michael introduced his dad, he said, you know, if my dad didn't deal with this stuff, if he didn't get sober, I wouldn't be here right now as, as a wounded healer helping you and all the many, many people that he helps. There's these, this ripple effect that comes from, from healing, from getting better. And there's also a ripple effect that terrifies me of, of not getting better. And, and when I see mm -hmm. myself in my kids and I see how I have denied, 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 no, I can handle this, handle this, handle this, <laughs> you know, and, and then watch the effects, you know, that's something I, I want to spare them of, I find it a, a, a very difficult struggle, and, and I want to share this conversation to, if you're struggling with addiction of any kind, whether it's alcohol or porn or, or anything, um, I, I just, I, I want you to hear the gospel, 
I want you to hear the good news, how that, how that impacts our addictions, and it's complicated, but simple too, in a way. Um, but, but then also want you to think, you know, yeah, you might think you have this under control, but even your efforts to get this under control are having ripple effects around you. And it's not necessarily about managing your sin. It's about freedom. And so that's what we're going to talk about. That's the, that's the, the, the summary. And so um, I should mention, you should go to restoringthesoul.com, restoringthesoul.com, and also michaeljohncusick.com, and you can follow Michael on Twitter at Michael J. Cusick. So you have endured another introduction. <laughs> 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 and now what? That was amazing. <laughs> Was it amazing? I I think he's ready for you to have ask an a al- question, altar call, yeah, and let's right. let's bring up the key, keyboard player and just as I am. Let's All bring right. this thing home. Well, I'm gonna sit back and uh, smoke my jewel and hope that it doesn't kill me. And uh, but <laughs> still addicted. But uh, John, so please tell us about the early days of when your dad was dealing with this stuff. I mean, I read someplace that you went to your first AA meeting when you were like four or five. What was the context? What was all that about? Well, my dad was working two full-time jobs. I was the youngest of five Irish Catholic alcoholic, uh, well, not alcoholic kids, not yet (laughs) anyway, when I was five. But um, when my dad uh, began his recovery, he was working two full-time jobs. And so he would take me as the youngest to the meetings. Hmm. And so my earliest recollection is that I think it was four years old where he would go ahead as the secretary of the meeting and volunteer and get there way in advance to make the coffee and set up the folding chairs. And if you've, uh, for those who are not familiar with going to a 12 step meeting, it's the worst coffee in the world, no matter where you go. The requirement is actually that it has to be sludge. But this was one of those 50 cup coffee pots where you'd basically take uh, a two pound can of coffee, dump it in, and then it would take an hour to percolate. Mm. And so I started my first addiction at that meeting because <laughs> I'd sit in the back row and I'd sneak over to the coffee machine and I'd fill a styrofoam cup halfway and then take the sugar container and just pour it in until the coffee <laughs> rose to the top. Yep. My son did that um, too. When we go yeah, to church, I, he would he would get the coffee in and, and he would sugar it up and cream it up. And I, I would say, you know, that's where they keep the Holy Spirit in the morning. <laughs> 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 that's great. But I, uh, I literally uh, would go to meetings with my dad all throughout uh, growing up until I was 18, and I'm involved in um, a 12-step recovery program now. Uh, but yeah, it, it, it profoundly impacted me, and it wasn't until my dad was gone that I began to think about this idea of legacy and whether or not we do our work to, uh, to get sober, to heal, to be restored, to uh, experience restoration, that really determines not just the kind of life that we live, but the lives of those who come after us, as you pointed out. Hmm. At this time, when you were young, say five years old, going to these meetings, was your dad like a dry drunk at that time? Had he gotten into real sobriety and, and, uh, or was he, was he still kind of struggling? What was, what was your environment at that at home at that stage. Yeah, in the mid 60s, he started going to AA and he was the youngest of seven Irish Catholic kids. And all but one of them ended up in the uh, recovery program. And the only one that didn't was a cloistered Carmelite nun. And um, I think she didn't have access to anything but communion (laughs) wine. But um, he my dad, my dad was sober for five years, and he was a dry drunk. And I love Robin Williams' definition of a dry drunk. He said, you're still uh, a behind. He uses another word that we often refer to as donkey. But he, he said, a dry drunk is somebody who you're still that, but you, you have less dents in your car. <laughs> <laughs> You've left the circus, but the monkey's still on your back. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So so what happened with my dad, literally after five years, as he was working two full-time jobs and he also had a part-time printing business in the basement and we were lower middle-class blue collar, um, he was going to meetings every single day. He took, he took to heart the kind of 90 and 90 days. And after five years of being very deeply involved, 
um, he worked in a steel mill. Uh, I'm sorry, he was working as a printer at that time, and he would get up in the middle of the night, and we had an elderly dog that had uh, pooped in the hallway. And my dad was going to the bathroom on his way to do his morning routine, and he literally stepped in the dog poop, and then he disappeared for a period of time. Uh, last last story he told me before he passed was that it was for a couple of weeks that he just went on a bender and drank. And then some friends from AA tracked him down and took him to inpatient treatment, which at the time was one of the few in the country, Rosary Hall, which uh, dried out a lot of the early and old timers from AA, because this was in Akron, Ohio, where the, the founding of AA was. But but literally when, uh, as the phrase says, that the SHIT hits the fan, and in this case, the SHIT hit the foot, and my dad <laughs> went from being a dry drunk to off the wagon and really just gone for a couple of weeks. We didn't know where he was. But then he spent, I think, almost two months in uh, the inpatient unit, and that's really when his life began to change. All right. Michael John Cusick is our guest. We're talking about a talk that his uh, dad gave and is featured on the podcast Restoring the Soul. You can go to restoringthesoul.com and, and you can hear that podcast and subscribe. Uh, so we're going to hear some about Michael's addiction and his journey towards desperation. And uh, like I like to say, uh, true spirituality is just desperation. <laughs> we'll see where that gets you on the other side of the break. Back to etc. It's Steve Brown, etc. Without Steve Brown this week, and the gang's all here. We got well, mostly we got Matt and Zach and Jinx and John and Kathy and myself, Eric here, and we're talking with our guest Michael John Cusick, and um, you got to visit him at uh, RestoringTheSoul.com and also MichaelJohnCusick.com and see what he. We'll talk a little bit about the intensive that intensives uh, that he offers uh, in just a little bit. Uh, before the break, we were talking about. Uh, uh, Jim, and uh, this is Michael's dad, and he was an alcoholic, and he passed away in 2015, correct? Is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yeah. Um, and this talk that Jim gave uh, was featured on the Restoring the Soul podcast, and we got to, got to thinking about the legacy of dealing with your stuff, <laughs> that if you don't deal with your stuff, whatever the addiction is or whatever the past brokenness is, it's going to have these ripple effects through, throughout your, your family, throughout your life, impacting countless others, generations to come. Uh, and, you know, if you don't deal with it, it affects them negatively. So um, we, in the last segment, we're hearing about some of Jim's experience. And uh, you had said during the break, Michael, that your dad saw recovery as basically growing up. Can you tell us what he meant by that? Yeah, he was given he was given the gift by a psychiatrist when he was in Rosary Hall back in the early 70s getting sober. Uh, the doctor sat him down and said, OK, we've got the results of all of the assessments. And my dad thought that this doctor was going to you know, diagnose him with some sophisticated psychological disorder. And the doctor said, you already know that you're an alcoholic, but your problem is you're immature and you need to grow up. And I think my dad's jaw dropped at the time and he sat on the edge of his bed for a long time. And then he said, I think he's right. I need to grow up. And what every addict does is at some stage in their development, no matter how young uh, the addiction starts, that addiction becomes a substitute for all of the healthy, quote, normal coping strategies that we would have. And my dad started drinking when he was 14 pretty heavily. And so he was stuck at the age of 14, even though he was a grown man with five children at that time. And uh, when my dad told me that story, my mind immediately went to the prophet John Mellencamp, who <laughs> in the authority song, <laughs> he said, uh, the line in the authority song is, I called my preacher 
and said, give me strength for my fight. And then interestingly, in the lyric, the preacher says, you don't need no strength. You need to grow up, son. Mm. And and I think that's a, a, a really um, prescient uh, lyric for my life and how that played out in my addictions. And I, I really think the work of uh, spiritual maturity and how spiritual and emotional health need to be two sides of the same coin that it really is about growing up into becoming ourself. Hmm. And so as you grew up, you developed addictions. Can you talk some about your experience in uh, how you led this dual life as a, a Christian man? I, I know that you felt uh, there, there was uh, this need to front and to put this image forward. And that was one life and then, uh, and, and, and kind of dictated by the, the Christian culture and what you perceived, you know, the, the whole gospel to be about. And then there was this other life, this hidden life, this secret life that you tried to bury. Can you talk some about that? Yeah, there was a lot of uh, dysfunction and abuse of different kinds in my family. And part of how that played out for me was I was exposed to pornography at a very, very young age. This was pre-internet, so it was magazines and and videos and movies. And so I uh, grew up in the Catholic Church and had all of the shame around all of the the using of that and the fantasy around that. And um, after I made my confirmation in eighth grade, I kind of didn't believe anything, had a very dramatic conversion to Christ through young life. And um, I immediately said, okay, this is all going to change now. So I took my stack of porn magazines that was hidden under my mattress, and I burned them in an incinerator when nobody was home. And I sincerely said, okay, this is the end of my struggle. God, I'm done with this. But it wasn't more than a couple of weeks later when I was back with it. And then the problem got worse because as a believer, it was suddenly unacceptable to not only do these things, but to talk about them. And I went to uh, a mentor or leader at the time in my life, and I said, I'm struggling with these things. And the person just said, you're a new creation. Uh, that's, that's, that's really not anything you have to concern yourself with anymore. It should just go away. And that was the worst thing that could have been said at that time, because then that made me hide in shame and basically say, I will never let anybody in and see my weaknesses, my shortcomings, and um, I'll basically never let myself be known. And of course, that's the worst thing that an addict can do because shame fuels addiction. And all of that led to, by the age of 22 years old, I was uh, acting out with uh, strip clubs and prostitutes and uh, pornography had certainly become an addiction at that point. I then developed uh, a significant uh, chronic abusing of alcohol and consider myself an alcoholic, and I've been sober since 98. Um, but in 1994, uh, after I was married for three years, I came home from work one day and got caught in a lie, and my double life of being in ministry and a Christian counselor and a uh, mm -hmm. professor at a Christian college, that double life was all exposed. And so... You know, growing up in AA didn't actually make me immune to the very addictions that eventually became part of my life. Mm. Oh, that's yeah, powerful. That's... You know, we, we may have to continue this on the other side, but just to ask, how much of your addiction do you feel like it was things that was learned behavior from your dad? How much of it is simply the slings and arrows of what it means to be a man growing up in a sinful, fallen world, and we all have to to struggle with these kinds of things? Yeah, great question. I think addiction is complex in that it is a physiological reality where our neural pathways and our nervous system are part of what uh, sets us up for addiction. I think it is emotional in terms of our coping strategies and how we were soothed when we were growing up. Um, I do think that there's a cultural aspect of this for me as a man, not being able to be vulnerable in culture, in Christian culture in particular, and uh, the, the whole uh, way that we define masculinity that played out in pretty significant ways for me in sexual addiction. 
Um, and I do think that if I had not been exposed to pornography, I was also sexually abused at a young age for a number of years, but that all went into it. Uh, there's a pretty big correlation between um, uh, abuse and wounds that people carry, whether those are wounds of absence, things that should have been done and weren't, or uh, wounds that are more things that were done that are traumatic. Hmm. Yeah, you're going to want to pick up Michael's book, Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle, and also go to RestoringTheSoul.com. You can subscribe to the Restoring the Soul podcast that we've mentioned and get a lot of resources there. And uh, when we get back, we're going to mention briefly uh, MichaelJohnCusick.com and what you can get there at uh, that website as well. Join us when we get back. We're going to continue the conversation and talk about brokenness, not as something to uh, hide or that gets in the way of life with God and others, but a a bridge to healing. Etc. Steve Brown, etc. Without Steve Brown this week, Eric here along with Matt, Zach, Jinx, John, Hello. and Kathy, and our guest Michael John Cusick. And you can go to his website, uh, MichaelJohnCusick.com, and you can also go to RestoringTheSoul.com. And I just want to mention briefly the the things that you can find there. I know at uh, Restoring the Soul, you have these um, these intensives. Intensive counseling, uh, uh, like weeks, I think, uh, like a week long thing. Can you talk about uh, as we talk about addiction? If you're finding yourself like totally trapped and you, you don't know how to get out of this stuff, I, I, I want to give you some resources. And Michael has some great resources. So can you tell people what they'd find there, and then also what you do at the other website? Yeah, we specialize at restoring the soul in doing intensive counseling, and I've put together a model called integrated clinical soul care. So. I'm trained as a spiritual director, and I've taught spiritual formation at seminaries, and I'm also a licensed clinician that specializes in trauma and addiction. So we blend the two of those together in a way that's pretty unique. And in intensive counseling, we meet with people three hours a day for one or two weeks for either 15 hours or 30 hours. And a person can do nine to 12 months of counseling. So when people are stuck and they can't wait months or years to get unstuck. Uh, People come to Colorado, and we work with couples and individuals, and people really experience breakthrough with that. And that's what I do uh, for our nonprofit ministry. And then I have a side consulting business where I work with Christian leaders from the marketplace and um, medicine and people in ministry where we do a number of programs as well, including leadership development and integrating spiritual formation with a lot of leadership principles, because leadership principles are often what to do, and leaders will only go so far with that. And uh, we all need help, but especially leaders in learning how to be, and then um, practices and things like that for how to become that. Mm-hmm. Speaking of Christian leaders, we have one here. It's uh, Zach Van Dyke, our resident megachurch pastor. Oh, my gosh. Uh, you have a question for our guest yeah, today, well, sir. Well, first of all, I want to say your Surfing for God book is so good uh, for dealing, uh, for addressing uh, the struggle uh, with, with sexuality and porn and lust. It is so helpful. And one of the things I love about it, I have a counselor friend who says, um, you know, you should never address someone's sin problem or their their you know some sinful behavior if you don't understand the holy longing beneath that behavior and uh, and that's what your book does it kind of shows that there is a longing there's a deep longing beneath some of those sinful behaviors and if you don't ever see that if you don't ever call that out you're going to be stuck in this kind of cycle of sin 
management. And, and so I, my question is, how do you move from that? I remember when I was in youth group, we, my little small group, we were all talking about how we didn't want to lust anymore. And uh, we all had to bring in $5. And then whoever <laughs> lasted the longest without lusting got the pot at the end. And, you know, oh, I, 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 that's I, how I learned to lie. I, I, well, listen, listen. <laughs> and that's how he became Christian of the right, Year listen, seven listen, times listen. in a row. The winner only had to go like two days or whatever. <laughs> but, uh, but, but you know, how, how for, do we move from that? For a bunch of reformed. For a bunch of reformed people, that comes pretty close to indulgences. You know, <laughs> five, five, I, I did not ten. say it was a good thing, but, but I'm wondering, <laughs> how do we move from that? Because we're so fearful uh, of really being desperate. Like, even though that's what the whole gospel is based on, we still as Christians want so hard to, to kind of pull ourselves up and prove that we're worthy of, of Jesus' sacrifice. Yeah, I think the answer to that is two questions. The first is something that we can do, and the second is something that we can't do. And the, uh, so the first thing is awareness. Uh, I think it was Ronald Rollheiser who interestingly wrote a book called The Holy Longing. He's a Catholic priest, and his book really inspired Surfing for God. I, I tell some stories about him in there. But Rollheiser said that all spirituality is about what we do with the unrest in our soul. Mm. And so uh, we, we need to become aware of that we're avoiding something, that we're escaping something, that all of our movement toward an object or substance or person or behavior of compulsion, that it's really a way to address this unrest deep inside of us. And sometimes the awareness comes first and sometimes it comes second. But the second thing is that we all need to come to a place of poverty. And by poverty, uh, I'm, I mean uh, emotional, relational, and spiritual poverty. It was Therese of Lisieux, uh, the Catholic saint who died when she was 24 and, and introduced the, the Catholic Church to what she called God's small way. And it was a way of not performing or being pious in the midst of the piety movement, but it was just being childlike. And so she said that, that poverty alone is our capacity for God. And again, not economic poverty, but this becomes the lens of the Beatitudes. And so we need awareness and we need poverty. And I'd like to paraphrase the poverty as I got no game. Mm -hmm. So when we often speak of brokenness in Christian culture, brokenness is often thought of like uh, a Psalm 51 on steroids where we're telling God how very, very sorry we are and how we promise we're not going to do it again. And it really leads to our own effort to try to never do the, quote, problem behavior. But when we say, I got no game, that is what opens the door to all the good stuff, to grace and the empowerment. And it's the first step of AA that we admit that we are powerless over a given behavior substance and... Uh, our lives are unmanageable as a result of it. Yeah. We got no game and we got no time. In this segment, we're <laughs> going to come back on the other side of the break and talk more with Michael John Cusick. Michael John Cusick is our guest here on Etc. Steve will be back next week, isn't that correct, Kathy? I believe so, yes, sir. All right, but this week it is just Etc. Steve Brown, Etc. without Steve Brown. And our guest is Michael John Cusick, and his book uh, that we've mentioned a number of times is Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. Mentioned some of that divine desire in the, in the last segment. And sorry to cut you off there, but um, I want to dive back into what we were talking about this uh uh, management of sin versus uh, brokenness and, and, and seeing brokenness not as a barrier to God and, and knowing God and loving others, but uh, as really a path to grace. So can you just pick it up where we left off? Yeah, I like to say, and you've alluded to it, that brokenness is not a barrier, but a bridge. And that's the whole, the whole theme of the gospel. You know, I also think that once we become Christians, 
our focus should not be on sin, but it should be on uh, being made whole. Uh, Paul Young, the author of The Shack, is uh, commonly known for saying that God doesn't save us so he can use us. He saves us to make us whole, and then he invites us to play. Mm -hmm. And I think play encompasses a life of worship and freedom and being unattached and unaddicted. But um, a lot of my thinking around this comes, interestingly, from Dallas Willard. And Dallas, uh, who I interviewed many years ago, said in that conversation that most of us as Christians are caught between ceaseless striving and brokenness, but that the gospel presents us with another way. And it's almost as if we have to accept that we're broken and live in whatever particular addiction or problem or compulsion we have, or we're just going around and around and around on the Jesus hamster wheel where we're trying to be good enough. In, in my life, it was like, if I pray enough, if I read my Bible enough, if I memorize enough scripture, that that's going to somehow be the key that turns the lock, that opens the door where I walk into this life that I've always dreamed of. And what I discovered on the, the best and worst day of my life in July of 1994 was that it's the surrendering of the striving and uh, the, the, the willing to be loved as I am and not as I should be that is really the doorway in. Mm-hmm. Michael, a minute ago you were talking about uh, about the issue of, of sin and, and um, you know, not focusing on it. Steve always, Steve Brown always uh, used the term, uh, talked about besetting sin. Um, and that was a term that from years and years and years ago, I really identified with because I, I feel like, and I don't think I'm that unique in this, but that there's, there's this one or these two or 25, whatever they are, that it seems like it's the same thing over and over and over again, that you just keep going back and saying, you know, I'm tired of bringing it to you. You have to be tired of hearing it. How how do you how does anyone get past that when you feel like it's the same thing over and over and over again? Yeah, which of course we can all relate to. And I don't mean to be flippant, but this is where the gospel comes in and this is where we need to redefine freedom. Freedom biblically is not just freedom from something. So in my case, freedom from porn, from sex, from alcohol, and now food, because I go to a 12-step group around overeating and compulsive uh, use of food. But freedom is toward something. It's toward love. It's toward being known. And so taking that idea that that's the freedom that we're called to, um, the first freedom within that is that we're free to not have to stop sinning. We're free to actually continue with our struggle for the rest of our life. And it's only when we become aware of that, and that's really the message of Galatians, that we begin to lose the passion for it. So it's like holding a beach ball underwater. When you press it down, you have to give your time and attention to it. And the minute that you either uh, let up on the pressure or the minute that you're distracted, that beach ball comes up with great intensity. So the first freedom is really, um, we don't have to not sin. Mm. And that's a great paradox. Yeah. Steve, Steve says it like, Steve says it like this, right? Like the only people who ever get any better are the people who know if they never get better, God will still love them, right? And so yeah. that that's the freedom, right? Yes. Yeah. But in, in my experience, yes, I, I, I let the beach ball up, and then I start bouncing it around like at a concert, <laughs> you know? And, like, I, I bounce it over to my friends, and they bounce it over to me, and, and then I find, you know, I, I'm not changing. So can you react to, to that? I mean, this, this messed up, twisted version of what yeah. you just said. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's the other side of the gospel, that we're, we're saved and we're brought into this, this kingdom. God's arms are open to anyone who wants him, but that the gospel is the reality of the kingdom in our life, and that that's a reality of restoration and God making all things new. And so fundamentally, Christianity is not something to believe. It's a way of being as we see what God is like revealed in the person of Jesus, and then as we apprentice ourselves 
to Jesus. And I would argue that the Christian life, as it is portrayed in the New Testament, is far more therapeutic than most of us think. And I oftentimes hear pastors talking against the therapeutic gospel, and I think, well, if it's not therapeutic, then I don't really want a part of that because I I need a lot of therapy. I'm pretty broken. Um, So the idea of how we change, I speak in Surfing for God of human brokenness with five W's. And I know I probably sound like a Dallas seminary grad with five <laughs> W's, but it's uh, the, 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 the sin part is represented by wickedness. And we hear that word and we think, oh, that's Osama bin Laden and Hitler. But wickedness is just Isaiah 53, that we turn away from God, we're like sheep and we go astray, we're independent and autonomous. The second W is weakness. And it's not weakness that we're supposed to have God strengthen us and overcome. It's weakness that needs to be surrendered, our limitations and our vulnerabilities. The third W is our woundedness, which includes all the ways that we've been hurt. And that raises questions about whether relationship and intimacy is good and whether I can be known. And that can include trauma. The fourth W is warfare. And those are the lies and deception of the enemy, things like shame and accusation of diminishment. And then the fifth W is our wiring, our neurology and our our nervous system. So when we look at wickedness, woundedness, weakness, warfare and wiring, it becomes a kind of comprehensive way of thinking about us as souls. And the Hebrew idea of soul is body, mind, will, emotions and will. And the Greek idea was just mind, emotions, and will. And we're just beginning to recover embodiment as both a way of working with people in therapy and recovery, but also in theology, the importance of our bodies and how God honors that. Yeah, man, so so fast. So, so good. You got to get this book, Surfing for God, Discovering the Divine Desire Beneath Sexual Struggle. Also go to Michael John Cusick dot com and go to restoring the soul dot com if uh, you or someone you know is at that place of desperation this is the way man this is the path so check it out look into it and be in touch with michael thank you for joining us sir appreciate it so glad to be here again all right we're gonna be back we're gonna find out who's gonna be here next week we know one person who's gonna be here next week steve brown's gonna be back and we'll find out who he's gonna be talking with join us on the other side of the break this is etc. Hey, you're listening to etc. It's Steve Brown, etc. Without Steve Brown. And uh, if you don't currently subscribe to our weekly email, the key life connection, then I, uh, I submit that your, your life is currently uh, half lived. So Tragic. <laughs> go to key life, go to keylife.org, subscribe and you'll thank me later. There's, there's a lot of stuff there that you get uh, on a weekly basis now, right? Weekly. Yeah. Stuff from Steve and uh, yeah, it's great. Even, yeah. Yeah. yeah you, seven you'll, days. you'll stay, you'll stay on the pulse of uh, grace in America. It's, it's amazing. Let me write that down. <laughs> grace in America. We are, we are, all right. Love new T- tough luck, Canadians. Grace in America. <laughs> so sorry. T- tough luck what? So sorry. Oh, yeah, Canadians. That's right. And we'll uh, we'll let some Canadians subscribe as well. So we'll please go to keylife.org. Man, you know, the, the, the last segment when uh, there were W's flying... You know, so many there, there was uh, so many W's. I, I, you know, I know weakness was was one of them. Uh, and wickedness, wickedness. Yeah. You know, the, the two, war, the, warfare. 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 Yeah, I think I'm That's subject good. to to those three, if not whatever the other ones were. Anyway, was the, whiskey one of them? <laughs> whiskey, whiskey, whiskey yeah. is right. another W that <laughs> I, I struggle with. I don't, I don't, think, <laughs> no? I don't think that's. In was that just book. me? No, Sorry. <laughs> woo woo. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, let's not even go there. The point <laughs> is, this is the point. Make it. It's complex. Mm. There are so many things that weave together to keep us trapped, to, to keep us in that place where we don't heal and thereby have that effect. And I, I wish we would have talked more about the next generation, but I think you have that effect that we want to have on, on the, the next generation, those people in our lives, whether it's our kids or, you know, how, however. Um, you know, let, let, let Michael and Jim just be an example of what happens when that's done right. 
you know, go to the, the restoring, restoring the soul.com, check that podcast out where you hear Michael's dad, Jim, tell his story. And, and then you, you listen to what you just heard and realize that's a direct, that's a linear thing, man. I mean, that was because his dad made the choices he made. Jim is here helping us heal and helping all these other people heal. And it can go the other way too. And you might think you have it under control like I do most of the time. But then when you get those glimpses, when you see, ooh, look at what the kids are doing. Look at the, oh, it's not very healthy. There's some bad stuff. When you realize that, realize it's complex. I'm getting back to the W's. Very complex. And you can't do it alone. That's what I wanted mm-hmm. to say. But you, you you got guys like Michael. You can go check out his website. You got you got counselors. You got you you know you, you hopefully the church. Yeah yeah <laughs> yeah right, right right. And the thing is, is you can make the decision at any point to take that step. Yeah yeah. You know yeah. It's really a you choice. Can do it today. All right. Next next oh, uh, next week. Completely off the subject of today. Mark David Hall and did America have a Christian founding? All right. Amen. America. Mark. Mark. Here we go. Motherhood right. apple pie in the U.S. of A. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you're bringing a pie? to be an American. Oh, flower power is back. Flower power. Flower power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us on Etc. Thank you for indulging uh, this, this little counseling session that I gave myself. <laughs> <laughs> for free. Yeah. You want to lie down? A- another one for free. Thank you, guys. Hey, until next time, may God bless the hell out of you. 